when they got to the 400-yard mark, the lieutenant said, now, now. And we opened up with everything we had. And it, it was a slaughter. My name is Vincent J. Speranza, and this is my story. I was born in New York City in 1925. You don't have to do the math, I'm 95 years old and counting. And grew up in a big uh, Italian neighborhood uh, where we did the usual little boy things, and, uh, but I've never in any serious trouble with the law. My parents were immigrants from Italia, from Italy, and uh, we grew up uh, as normal as people could during the Great Depression. I was uh, a pretty good student in school, and uh, I got into the usual troubles of uh, putting frogs down uh, the girls' uh, blouses, and uh, we got our usual punishment from the teachers. At any rate, uh, it was uneventful. I uh, graduated from uh, uh, public school 22, went to high school, and fast forward to 1941. I was a 16-year-old boy in high school, and uh, it was a Sunday, I was riding my bike, uh, and when I went into the store, everything was quiet. And I said, hey, and they said, shut up. President Roosevelt is speaking. He's saying something about the Japanese and, and Pearl Harbor. I jumped on my bicycle, quickly ran home and told my father to quickly put the radio on. He put the radio on in time for us to hear President Franklin D. Roosevelt saying, a state of war exists between the empire of Japan and the United States of America. At that moment, my father turned around. He called his four sons. I was the middle boy. He said, boys, he said, they won't take me because I'm too old. But I expect my sons to... We said, we know, Papa, they won't take us till we're 18. And he said, I know. He said, but I just want you boys to know how I feel about it. No place in this entire world can you come to a place with nothing except a willingness to work. And look at us today, a family, eight children, we have a home and a car. He said, boys, this country must not fail. And <laughs> The next day, we started saying, how in the hell can we get into this fight? And, and uh, we let the few hairs that we had <laughs> grow on our cheeks and put on our father's fedoras. And we went down to the recruiting office and we said, we want to join the army, we're 18. The recruiting sergeant looked at us and said, go home, kid, come back when you're really 18. I had to wait two more years before I finally turned 18, and it was on M March 23rd, 1943, before I could apply for the, for, the, for the Army. And at that time, you could not volunteer. They, they uh, had quotas for each city, and uh, when your city got the quota to uh, send so many men to the, to the uh, services, uh, it was October before I was finally called and sent to Fort Benning, Georgia, the infantry school. I uh, loved it. A big sergeant comes out, and he lines us up. We're all 18-year-old kids. And he says, my name is Masterelli. You got it? And we said, yes, sir. He said, don't give me that, sir, shit. That saved that for the officers. 
He said, Master Ellie, Sergeant Master Ellie, and when I say jump, you say, how far and how high? You got it? He scared the hell out of us. He said, now get into those barracks and come out looking like soldiers. That began our 19 weeks of infantry training, and we lapped it up. We couldn't wait to get uh, our guns and our training, and uh, because we wanted better. It looked bad, you know. Germany had taken all of Europe, and and uh, and uh, uh, the Ukraine was on her way to Russia. The, the Japanese had taken everything all the way down, almost to Australia, and and uh, the United States was. Uh, really in danger, and we uh, said, okay, now uh, we're going to get into the fight, right? After the 19 weeks, of, no, you got to come back for four more weeks of advanced infantry training. Okay, so we come back for four more weeks of advanced infantry training. Now we're going to get into the fight, right? No, uh, you got to come back for two more weeks of uh, heavy weapons training. We said, when the hell are we going to get into this fight? And the, uh, the, the two weeks heavy weapons training, finally, they sent us to um, uh, infantry line, infantry outfits, and I was sent to the 87th Infantry Division, the Aquan Division, at uh, Fort Jackson, South Carolina. And we said, all right, now we're going to get in. Uh, maneuvers in Tennessee, uh, uh, jungle training in Florida. We said, what the hell? One day, they took us out to a big field. They said, it's going to be a demonstration today. We said, what kind of demonstration? Shut up and sit down. So we sit down. Three C-47s come out of the sky, fly out in front of us in the field, and then we see the doors open, and we see guys throwing themselves out of their doors, and the little white things open up, and they come floating down to the ground. You know, paratroops were brand new in World War II. They were just getting started. And we see these guys get on the ground, roll up their chutes, come double time and across the field. They line up in front of us. And the captain comes by and says, all right, this is the United States Parachute Corps. We're looking for a few good men. You have to be a graduate of the infantry school, and have all your advanced infantry training. Who wants a volunteer? And we said, but uh, throw yourself out of an airplane? And he said, and there's 50 bucks extra a month jump pay. And that's how I ended up volunteering for the paratroops. Back to Fort Benning to uh, jump training now. and. The most magnificent training you ever saw. They turned us into human dynamos. They, they not only taught us all the different ways to kill somebody, but how to defend yourself, but also to have that aggressive spirit, that, 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 that thing in here that when you think you can't do anymore, you can. And, and that's what comes back to you in, in combat, you know. When the things get so bad, you say, geez, I can't. The hell you can't. You remember in training when you were positive you couldn't do anymore? With those sons that came around, get those arms up, get that thing moving, and you did it. And, and that, that stood us in good stead. You know, when, whenever I talk to the troops, I tell them, uh, if you want to take any advice from a PFC, uh, pay attention to your training. Don't ever take it for granted. Your training is what is going to save your life, or at least make you one of the better soldiers uh, fighting for the country. First of all, you're well trained on the ground, and you're um, toughened up uh, physically, but also mentally. They keep reminding you that a paratrooper gets into the battle in a very unique way. He jumps out of an airplane and gets into it. Now, if you pay attention to the instruction, if you listen to the teacher, you won't have any trouble. You learn how to, f how to uh, maneuver your chute just a little bit. In those days, you couldn't, today you can maneuver them 
But back then, you couldn't eat just a little bit of, of um, a pull on the risers. But um, the physical training gets you ready for any kind of uh, landing. You learn to roll. Uh, it's called a uh, parachute landing fall, a PLF. And uh, you're trained very well on the ground. But then, of course, you know, the moment of truth is... Uh, and... and uh, uh, Another anxiety is, in those days, part of your training is also parachute packing. You learn how to pack a parachute, and they tell you to pay attention because you're going to jump, your first jump in a parachute that you packed. Uh, you never saw a more attentive class in your whole life. And we paid attention, so on. We, but then you packed the parachute on Friday. The jump is Monday, so you got nice all weekend to worry. Did I do it right? Is this the sergeant? Can I go? No, you, you did your thing, and that's it. And that day, uh, the first jump, you uh, you you're looking all around, and every, there's always bravado. Hey, piece of cake. So you throw yourself out and been talking, but you know there's the anxiety, I guess. But uh, you're supposed to be tough, and you don't show it. Oh, everybody calmed it. Then the, the moment they blows the whistle, all right, first squad board. You get you get on the airplane, and you're sitting there wheeling, and you keep che checking all your <laughs> connections. <laughs> and and uh, as soon as the plane takes off, the, the sergeant says, uh, all right, the smoking lamp's lit. Now, I didn't smoke, I, and I was a virginal when I got in the service. I didn't smoke, I didn't drink, I didn't, didn't know anything about women. And, and uh, I see all these guys uh, putting cigarettes. Uh, it seemed to do something for I said, hey, give me one of those. So I took one, and I lit it. <laughs> and I choked, and I spit, and I coughed, and I, and I was hacking away, and so on and so on. Stand up! Hook up. Stand in the door. And now, you know, the, the, the choking spittings all of a sudden disappears. And now you're looking at the door and uh, you remember your father. My father uh, was the one who took me to the train when I was leaving for the service. He told everybody, you say goodbye to Vinny here at home, and I'm going to take him to the train station by myself. And I expected that uh, the reason he said that is he wanted to talk to me on, on the way. He didn't say a word. All the walk to the, to the train station, he didn't say anything. The train came in, he still hadn't said anything. I get on the train, and I'm looking at him and looking at him. And before the train pulled out, he said, you look me in the eye, you me, he said. Non fa mai una cosa ni fu calare la testa. Which in English means, son, just don't do anything to make me hang my head in shame. I, I barely choked out. I won't pop. And when you're making your first jump, or when you get your first combat, what comes back to you? Your father's saying, hey, make sure you don't do anything to shame the family, you understand? And your answer is, that one. And when that moment came, and I describe it in the book when you read the book, go! I was number three in the lineup. First guy's out, second guy's out. Not a moment's hesitation to throw it in the yard. Ah, hey! Phew! And, 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 you you terrified that the, the first part that you go out there, there's nothing holding you, touching nothing, and, and suddenly the static line starts pulling your shoot out, and you feel something, and and at, at the end of the 30 feet, you know the parachute and, and is 32 feet, and the static line is 30 feet. You're 60 feet down, and the prop blast, and the shoot opens. And you're first, uh, you're, you're, or when you're training, they say, check your canopy. You look up, and quiet. The chute is out there, big, beautiful thing there, and you're swinging. 
it is the most beautiful thing in the world. Whatever scary sensations you had before disappear into the comments like somebody just took you in a cradle, you know, and the rock you dies. And, and then all of a sudden, the floor, the ground's coming up pretty fast, but your training kicks in. You knees and feet together. When you land, you run. You can't believe it. You're on the ground there and you're looking up like this, and you said, I jump. I neither shit my pants nor peed my, my boots. I'm a paratrooper. And then you say, but wait, you got four more to go. <laughs> So, but but hey, that first experience, you now you have complete confidence. The second, third, fourth day, the only one you worried a little bit about was the the Friday night jump, and and uh, th that that jump, you know, at nighttime everything's different. First of all, the air is thinner; you come down faster, and and uh, bushes and trees look uh, different at night. And uh, in fact, in, in my class in jump school, two guys mistook a concrete highway for the Chattahoochee River, which was alongside our camp. And in the moonlight, they thought the, the, the highway was the river. Now what you're taught to do if you're gonna land in water is loosen your harness, hold on to the parachute with just your hands, and about 10, 15 feet, above the water, let go of the parachute so that when you hit, the parachute won't cover you and smother you in the water. Uh, these guys, uh, and it's hard to judge what's 10 or 15 feet, they, they let go of the parachute too quick and they splattered themselves. And, and, uh, and uh, it, it put a damper on that day, but hey, the next man morning is when you were graduating, you're gonna get your wings and you're going to be authorized to blouse your pants over the jump boots. Only paratroopers were allowed to do that, and only paratroopers who had completed their training and, the, and their, their first jump. And so you felt bad about what happened, but hey, tomorrow I'm getting the, the silver wings. And uh, that next day you never saw. By the way, right after that, they give you a week's furlough home and you can't believe walking down the neighborhood with uh, wings and jump boots, pants bloused, and and the girls, paratroops were, uh, you know, the the special forces of the day, and uh, they had made such a reputation in no in uh, Normandy that uh, let's say we were very popular with the ladies. <laughs> Graduated from from uh, jump school, and uh, in jump school, no fooling around. They uh, immediately send you to uh, uh, Fort, Fort Shanks in New York, and uh, ready to go overseas. Uh, I went overseas on the Queen Mary. The uh, uh, Queen Mary had been converted to a troop ship, and uh, it, uh, it got us over there in about five days, six days. We landed off Scotland. You know, the, the only place the Queen Mary could land was uh, Southampton, but Southampton was in the channel where the Germans had control. And so they, they uh, docked outside of Scotland, and then in smaller boats took us ashore, put us on trains down into England, and into a barracks waiting to be sent to France to get into the fight. In the meantime, the 101st Airborne Division had uh, taken a real beating in Holland. Uh, the Market Garden operation was a complete failure. The 101st, the 82nd, and uh, the, the Polish Brigade, and the British Red Devils, and the Canadian paratroopers all went in to Holland on, December, on September 17th, and uh, the Germans uh, caught them flat-footed and, and uh, cut off the, the roads that the armor was supposed to come up to support the paratroops. The armor never got there. The paratroops got beat and had to come back out. So here's the 101st Airborne Division now in northern France, Camp Mormelon. 
Uh, they had lost 3,000 men. They had left most of their equipment and so on in, in Holland. They were in bad spirits. They were, uh, you, as you could understand, uh, you know, in, in Normandy, a tremendous victory. In Holland, they, they got beat. And, and uh, we were the replacements now for the guys that got killed. And uh, it was December. And everybody thought, as usual, wars wind down in the winter time, and and uh, the uh, time was to be to train the new men and help them you know, get some uh, uh, combat experience. And uh, the division was planning all kinds of things. We were going to have uh, sports programs and so on, and and uh, passes to Paris and so. On. On December 16th, nobody knew it. Nobody realized it. Not even the Allied High Command. The Germans had saved up 25 divisions. There's 18,000 men in each division. They had, they had nine of those 25 divisions, Panzer divisions, with the newest tanks, the Mark IVs, the Tiger Royals, and so on. And December 16th, they hit the Allied lines in the Ardennes. Hitler's plan was to move from the Ardennes through Belgium and capture the port of Antwerp on the ocean there. Antwerp was our port of entry where all our supplies came in and all the equipment and so on that um, they were going to take for themselves that move, had they captured Antwerp, would have separated the British and Canadian armies in the north from the American armies in the south and would have changed the war. Their problem was to get to the Ardennes, to get to Antwerp, there was a little town here called Bastogne. It, uh, it was a transportation hub. It had five roads. It was just a small village, but it had two railroads going through it and five roads and so on. And they had to capture that if they're going to get to Antwerp. And uh, Eisenhower sent word out to the 101st Airborne Division, get up there and hold it. Now, of course, we private, we don't know anything that's going on. All we know is 4 o'clock in the morning, the sergeant comes out, banging on it, all right, drop your and grab your socks, we're moving up. And we're all sort of growing, oh, come on, are you crazy? We'll all break our legs. He said, you're not jumping. You're going to go up in trucks. <laughs> and then from all over the barracks, Sarge, I don't have a helmet. Sarge, I don't have a rifle. I was a machine gunner. I didn't have a machine gun. All, all I had was a, a trench knife. The, and and uh, uh, some of them didn't have helmets. And the sergeant said, stop bitching, make a list. We're going to stop and get what you need along the way. And we believed it. We said, oh, okay. <laughs> we made a list. I need a machine gun. I need at least uh, 10 belts of ammunition. And I, I, I would like a, a carbine beside the back of it. What stop? <laughs> All day and all night on those trucks, you cannot believe that ride, we were madder at each other than we were at the Germans when we got to Beston. The, 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 the problem was no stops. And, uh, you know, nature's calls cannot be ignored. And so his guys all over the place trying to pour, pouring it all over the men, the guys would pee off the side of the truck, the wind would blow it right on the guys in the back and so on. Everybody's hollering and yelling. And we were also freezing. We had no winter clothes. All we had was those uh, jacket, the, the, the summer jacket, and, and, and uh, the uh, cotton pants and so on. And, and, well, we were in very bad shape when we got to Bastogne, not in the mood to do anything. We, we got off the trucks and the sergeants threw a little gasoline on the road to lit it and try to warm my hands a little bit. We were freezing and shivering and so on. But we were still, they, later on they gave us the number. 10% of us were unarmed. What saved us was, 
when the Germans first hit, th there were four American divisions, the 4th, the 28th, the 128th, and the 9th Armored, which the Germans destroyed completely. They, they just swamped over them in one day. The stragglers from those four divisions were ordered to the rear. They had to go through Bastogne. So we get off the trucks. We walk into the, uh, into the town. The town is a mess. Things going crazy in all directions. Uh, as the regular troops there were being retreating to, uh, to the rear, and we were moving in. And we would just go up to the guy and say, hey, you're going back. You don't need right. We took the rifle right off his shoulder. Hey, uh, listen, uh, you go, let, me, let me have your... Uh, I found a guy with a nice light 30 caliber machine gun, and I said, ooh, that looks so heavy for you, but let me help you carry it. And, and I, I uh, took the gun, and at least for the first fight, I had a gun, and I had two belts of ammunition. And we get, uh, finally get pushed through the mess. The 501, my regiment, was the first one out of town and able to go out, and, and you know, nobody knows what's coming. All they could tell us was the, the Germans are out there in force. And the 501, by the way, is right in the path. We were steadied to the, uh, the Longville Road that w went through Belgium that the German armies were coming through. Where it hit Bastogne, we were here, right in front. Uh, and, but still, n nobody knows what's going on. My regimental commander, um, uh, Captain Ewell, uh, Colonel Ewell, uh, is told to go out there and develop the situation while we try to get set up in, in the town. And uh, Colonel Ewell did just that, and they say later on that that man's actions uh, that day uh, s saved Bastogne because what he did was <laughs> when <laughs> he only had his first battalion with him. The second and third battalions were still in town struggling to get out. He runs into the Germans. Instead of pulling back, he attacks. He attacked and it stunned him. It stopped him. They didn't know what was going on. In time for us, the, the second and third battalion to get out of town, set up a defense perimeter, which for the rest of that battle never got breached. They never got past that first line he set up and we uh, took the first hit. We hadn't had any food or water since we got off the truck. We were exhausted, and it tells us, right, dig a hole now. And the ground's frozen, and you bang it with the shoulder, it bounces back in your face, and you bang, and you bang, and you bang. And finally, we, we got uh, past the, the uh, uh, frozen part, and you know, machine guns have to dig a two-man hole machine gun and assistant gunner, and, and we finally got through to the, and then there's the roots of the, the trees and so on. It, it took us hours and hours to, to, to just get a, a hole dug, and it was about three, four o'clock in the morning. We, we flopped into the hole then, the sergeant comes around, all right, we're moving out. Oh, God. We have to dig in over there. So you pick up the gun and the equipment, and you, you walk over there like you're in a daze, and uh, now dig in here. Well, we whacked and whacked, and we got a little shallow thing done, and there, there was, we couldn't do anymore. So we just flopped in the, the little shallow hole we dug, and the sergeant comes around again. We're moving out. That's all. Got to dig in over there. The last place we went, we just scraped the snow and the side and lay on the ground. The we, we were spent. We couldn't do anything. No. no matter how young and strong you are, there's only so much. That morning, the fog was all the way down to the ground. You couldn't see anything. As daylight comes, the fog starts to lift a little bit. And uh, the, 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 the more time went on, the more the fog lifted, but it lifted in, in like a bank, a, a whole, as it lifted, you could see underneath it all the way through that uh, what was in front of us was a sort of tapering open field with the heavy woods on both sides. And the noise we heard, it looked like the Germans were gonna attack across an open field. We said, boy, they must be cocky, you know. They're, 
But they were cocky. They had just smashed four American divisions, and they expected to do the same thing. They didn't know it was the 101st Airborne Division there in, in um, Bastogne. So they, uh, the, 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 as, the, as the fog lifted higher and higher, uh, then you hear the tanks wind up, and you could, you could see across that still open snow field, the, the, the grinding of the 88s as they swing around. And then the whole world sounded like it exploded. Everything you could imagine. They had rockets, artillery. Later on, the Luftwaffe came in and bombed it. Uh, mortars all around it. And you, you, you can't do anything except stick your nose down to the bottom of the, of the foxhole and, and hope that uh, you curse yourself for not digging it deeper. And uh, the, the ground shakes, and, and, and uh, sometimes the, the concussion makes you feel like your helmet's going to come off. That's when they, they told us, by the way, don't fasten your, your uh, helmet buckle, because uh, if you get a near concussion, it's going to pull your head right off. At, at any rate, we, we could do nothing but wait till the artillery barrage lifted. And when it did, and we looked across the field, here comes a row of tanks, and behind them, a German infantry. Now the tanks are firing point blank into the foxholes. When, when they hit, the guy disappears, his rifle goes floating around up in the air, and so on and so on. And, and the German infantry is is acting like they, they were they, they were you know uh, animated they, they were pumped up because they had just uh, smashed four American divisions and they were expecting to do the same thing here and the ground sloped from where we were dug in the ground sloped about four hundred yards down to, and 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 then then it started up again to where they were. And the lieutenant said, set your gun for 400 yards. He, he wanted to catch them on the way up. So we set the machine gun at 400 yards. The tanks now are coming on top of us, and, and uh, the German infantry is, is behind them. When they got to the 400-yard mark, the lieutenant said, now, now. And we opened up with everything we had. And it, it was a slaughter. The, the snow turned red. The, they were falling by the numbers and so on. And, and we hit them so bad that they weren't expecting uh, that uh, they had to turn around and go back. What was left of them? The tanks now, when the infantry's not behind them, they got to turn around and go back. So as the tanks turned around to go back, our artillery opened up. And McAuliffe, uh, you, you know, the, the general, the, the, the uh, commanding officer, the commanding general, uh, the hello, uh, was in the States making speeches. You know, they thought the war was going to wind down in December. Uh, the, the assistant commander was in England uh, making speeches. The only general officer on the, on the post there when we were called up was uh, McAuliffe, and he was uh, the artillery commander. But he's now in command of the whole division. And it's, uh, now we say it was a damn good thing because I don't know if the other generals would have been able to do with the, our artillery what McAuliffe did. He set the guns up so that they not only fired at the perimeter, but he set them on the ground where they could also turn around and fire across town to any spot, which meant all the guns could be concentrated on one spot, wherever the Germans tried to attack. And he played hell with their new tanks. At any rate, they, uh, the, the first day... They, they were stopped and, and uh, went back into the woods. And uh, we finally got some 
K rations to eat and a little water and so on and so on. And we're waiting for the next day's attack. The next day, they slipped around on both sides and surrounded us. They didn't attack, they, they, they just surrounded us. And uh, doing that, they captured our field hospital. All of the beds and blankets and equipment and medicine, morphine and so on, and uh, they shot the American personnel, except the doctors. They kept five of our doctors to serve in their army. One doctor and one Belgian nurse escaped and were in town. For that whole battle, by the way, for the next eight days, that was our medical team, one doctor and one Belgian nurse, and no medical equipment. And, and in surrounding us, they now uh, began you know, daily attacks and so on. And, and uh, the second day after they, they surrounded us, my friend Joe Willis uh, got hit. And the only place in town to put the wounded was uh, the, the floor of the church and the seminary across the street from the church. They, they were the only buildings that still had uh, stone you know, walls and uh, everything else was smashed and flattened. And, and uh, they put the guys on, it was, it was a pitiful sight when I saw it. The guys laying all over the place on the floor. We, we had gone through the houses and, and uh, pulled all the uh, drapes and curtains, uh, beds, whatever we could find to, to wrap the, the wounded in, the warm, to keep them warm. Uh, those of us that had two blankets donated one to the, to the uh, wounded. And uh, I see my friend Joe Willis on, on the floor of the church. Uh, and I said, Joe, how, how, how you doing? He said, ah, I'm nothing. I got a couple pieces of shrapnel in the legs. He said, I'll be out of here tomorrow. I said, you'll be out of here tomorrow? Well, tomorrow, the next day or so on, he said, I'm going to be here long. It's a couple of pieces of shrapnel in the legs. So I said, well, that's good, Joe. Come on, you know, I need you. You're an assistant gunner. And, and, and I, I uh, you know, was just kind of shaking my head. Uh, when I saw him laying there, I didn't think he looked like he was going to be in any shape to come back out tomorrow. But uh, before I left, I said, listen, Joe, I've got to go back. Uh, anything I can do to, to uh, help you? He said, yeah, go find me something to drink. I said, Joe, where the hell am I going to find you something to drink? We're surrounded and cut off. There are no supplies coming in here. He said, go look in the taverns. Joe, the taverns are all bombed as shit. Go look in the taverns. You might get lucky. Now... It's snowing hard. It's cold. The wind is blowing like hell. Artillery is dropping in all around the church. And I go slopping down the road looking for a tavern. And uh, the first one uh, I, I went into, all oh, broken glass, it shattered, there, there was nothing. I went down the road a little further, slipping and sliding all over the place. And the second tavern I went into, Still had a bar, and when I pulled the, the, the beer handle, beer came out. I said, ooh. So I look around for a jug, a bottle, or something to put the beer in. There was nothing. I took off my helmet. The same helmet you use in the foxhole, you know, there. I switched a little snow in it. I filled it up with beer. <laughs> I went back to the church. Joe, I got some beer. He said, holy shit. <laughs> he sits up, and I'm feeding beer from the helmet. Hey, give me some of that. Uh, hey, give me some of that. You know, I was like an old mother cow there, feeding all these guys a mouthful of beer. I ran out. Joe says, go get some more. Jesus Christ, Joe, go get some more. I go slopping down the road, fill up the, the helmet again, as I stepped out the door of the tavern, a shell landed nearby, knocked me down, and I spilled half of the beer, but I didn't get hurt. And I got up and I went back to the church. This time, standing in the doorway like this, is the regimental surgeon, Major Walkman. I'm a, I'm a private, by the way, PSC. 
He says, what the hell do you think you're doing, soldier? I said, oh, uh, 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 sir, uh, uh, bringing aid and comfort to the wounded? He said, listen, smart ass, don't you know I've got chest cases and stomach cases and if you give them B, you'll kill them? Yeah, therefore I have you shot. Yes, sir, and put that helmet on. I was not only freezing, I was now cold and wet, and, but I slopped back quick to the foxhole before he changed his mind. And as far as I was concerned, hey, an incident that happened during the war. There was a lot of incidents like that. I forgot about it. No. 65 years after the war was over, and I went back to Bastogne for the first time. It, it was like a, a miracle. Uh, you, know, what, you know, when I came home from the war, I was 20 years old. I, I was a different person from the 18-year-old kid that went into the battle. And uh, I remember as a kid reading and seeing the movies about the World War One guys when they came home. Uh, the, the, Battle shock and uh, uh, nightmares and uh, the shivers and personality beating their wives and all that. When I came home, I looked in the mirror in my mother's house. I said, Listen, I talked to myself. I said, Listen, you are not going to be one of these guys who comes home and has uh, nightmares and flashbacks and so on. You're going to take all that crap, uh, cutting people in half with a machine gun and uh, put it back here and lock the door. You can't forget it, but you can isolate it. You can... And I was very successful. When I... After I got home the war, I, I met a nice woman. I got married. I became a school teacher. And I uh, had kids, grandkids and everything. For 65 years, I did not touch any military organization. I didn't join anything. I didn't even know the celebrations were going on in, in, uh, in France and Belgium. So I, I, I said to myself, you're not a soldier anymore, you're an educator. And I dedicated my life to education. What happened was an incident, and again, I think the last part of my life has been a series of coincidences that, that changed my whole life around uh, from, from an 85-year-old man sitting around waiting to die to uh, today I'm a playboy running around the world, <laughs> going to Europe. And, and, and at any rate, what happened was... Uh, my wife, my wife's uh, Alzheimer's got worse, and I, I had to put her permanently in a nursing home. I was 85 years old at the time, and and uh, for me, hey, that's it, man. You know, you know, I had been married to that woman altogether when she passed away 70 years, but uh, at that point, 65 years, and she was my whole thing. Now she's gone. And I just, I went into it like a funk, you know. And it, uh, but I was in the store one day, and I, and I meet a woman who's got an accent. I said, uh, Madame, do I know the French accent? And she said, uh, no, Belgique. I said, oh, Belgium. And she, she said, yes. She said, uh, well, do you know uh, Belgium? <laughs> I said, yeah, bombs, bullets, and snow. That's what I know about Belgium. And she said, oh, you were there during the war. I said, yeah. She said, with the 101st Airborne Division? I said, yeah. She said, oh, monsieur, I'm from Boston. She said, uh, you have not been back. I said, no. I said, monsieur, you must go back. She said, the people of Boston have never forgotten the 101st Airborne Division. There are monuments to you all over town. There are statues. They have celebrations every year. They reenact the battle. They, they, she said, you must go. And I said "What?" to myself, what the hell for? And I've spent a lifetime forgetting about all this stuff. Why do I want to go to Rwanda? And, and, and she said, uh, and she said, and all the American dead from the battle are in a beautiful cemetery right near, and, and that's when I said, you know, 
if nothing else, uh, I need to go back at least one time to pay my respects to the, to some guys who are buried there. So I, I I announced to the family, I'm I'm going to, you, everybody starts hollering me, Pop, you're 85, what are you going to do running around the bus store? I said, well, then you come with me, one of you, you could take it. My, my daughter came with me. We went to bed. The plan was we were going to spend three days in Baston, and then I was going to take my daughter to Paris. You know, she'd never been. So three days in Paris, and come home, and that's the end of it. Again, one coincidental thing after another that, that changed my life. The first day we were there in Baston, the, now, you know, we know nobody, we, know no, we have no connections, nobody's meeting us, nobody, we, we just decided we were gonna rent a taxi cab, go out of town and see if I could <laughs> remember anything. And uh, on the way to the bank to change our money to euros, my daughter sees a, 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 a mannequin in a window with an American paratrooper's uniform on, the 101st Airborne patch, and she says, look, Pop. And I said, yeah, well, okay, but let's go. Now, if I had prevailed, everything would be different today. I'd probably not be around. But she insisted, oh, Pop, let's go look. You know, it might be something interesting. So I said, okay. We go in there, we look around, and then we we're on our way out. And I see a, a, a case with German belt buckles and so on, so now I stopped for a minute to look at that. And this big, I later found out he was a, a, a Dutch uh, paratroop officer. Uh, he come around perfectly and he said, uh, may I help you? I said, no, nah, uh, I'm just looking. I, I was here during the war. He said, you were here during the war? I said, yeah. He come around there. I thought he was going to attack me. I went to a defense mode. He picked me up and said, Sir, where have you been? There are so few of you left. We, we want to honor you. We, you. Sir, uh, who are you with? And I said, H Company, 501. He said, you know, he said, we studied the war. We studied the war, and we know where everybody was, where the attacks came from. He said, Come with me, he said. I, I am going to show you where H Company was dug in, uh, in at Mont. I said, really? He said, yeah. So my daughter and I get in the car, and, and a friend of his, Johnny Bone, a Belgian tank commander, gets in the car with him, and the four of us drive out a little ways out of the town. Now, I recognize nothing. You know, during the war, it was all snow, excuse me, big snow fields. I could... But he takes us out to a place there, the ridge, and, and uh, again, I, I, I don't recognize a thing. And he said, now look, he said, H Company was dug in here, 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 and on the ridge. And then he looks me in the eye, and he says, and that was your foxhole. I said, hey, stop jerking me off. How the hell do you know that was my foxhole? I can understand you knowing where H Company was dug in. He said, because your company commander, Captain Stanley, when he turned in his after-action report that day, on a piece of cardboard from a K-ration, he had put a little diagram where he placed the automatic weapons. He said, you were the only machine gun in the 3rd platoon, right? I said, yeah, the other guy got killed. He said, look, MG, you. Now, you have to picture this. You're 85 years old, and somebody is saying to you, where you're standing right now, 72 years ago, you were a 19-year-old kid with a machine gun waiting for the first German attack. You know, when you're 85, you don't have the same control. I, I fell apart then. My daughter pulled me aside. She said, Marco, listen, my father said, no. And uh, we'll come back tomorrow. So he said, okay, and we got in the car. On the way back to town, I asked the two guys if I could take them to lunch. And they said, yeah. And so at lunch, <laughs> I, we, I ordered three bottles of wine, and uh, I said, I'm going to change the mood here. I don't like the way. Well, you know, you put three soldiers and three bottles of wine together, and you know what's going to happen. We started getting loud and making noise, and everybody's looking, and we embarrassed the hell out of my daughter. And as we... As we uh, 
uh, get a little more uh, uh, loose tongue from the white. They start telling stories. Johnny Boner told a story about the Belgian tanks, and Marco told about fighting in Bosnia and uh, Afghanistan and so on. And I told him that beer story I told you before. While I'm telling the story, they're going, you? You were the GI who brought beer in the, the helmet? I, I said, yeah. He said, you, you, you went in the church and you gave beer to the wounded guys laying out like that? I said, yeah. They said, man, they said, don't you know you're famous in Europe? I said, what the hell are you talking about? I said, wait, come here. Bring us four bottles of airborne beer. And the waiter comes back, and on a tray, he's got four bottles of beer and four little ceramic bowls in the shape of a GI helmet that they serve it in. And the label on the bottle of beer shows a paratrooper with a helmet full of beer going like this. They said nobody thought that was a true story. Everybody thought that was just a bull story from World War II. So a, a Belgian brewer about 20 years ago just decided to honor this mythical GI, and he produced airborne beer. He said, we can't believe it. The, the guy, it's a true story, and the guy who did it is really here. I said, yeah, maybe I should get a cut on the beer, right? But at any rate, when I came home, they gave me four bottles of beer to bring home. And, and uh, I don't know how, but the Journal Register called me, yeah, from Springfield, you know, the, the, new, the newspaper. And they said, uh, listen, we heard a story about you. Can we come over and interview you? You know, and I said, yeah. And we sat there. And I told them the story. And, you know, they came with a photographer. And uh, if you've got a cell phone, just Google airborne beer. And there'll be a picture of me behind the counter there with the bottles of beer lined up and so on and so on. And uh, a story. The next day, they put that picture in, in the newspaper. Somebody from the, from the newspaper from the, put it on the internet. Phew. Today, this day, I am better known what I did with a helmet full of beer than what I did with my machine gun the whole war. I, I'm, I'm a decorated combat veteran. I got two Purple Hearts, two Bronze Stars, the French Legion of Honor, the Dutch Order of this, 15 medals. What does anybody want to hear when they, hey, then, tell us the beer story. Uh, the thing went viral. It's all over the internet. Now, if you Google YouTube and my name, uh, there's video clips that, at any rate, uh, I started getting invitations from, uh, you know, Fort Bragg and Fort Jagger, and, and uh, uh, they liked the way I speak, and so they asked me to talk to the troops here and talk to me there. And at age 89, I wrote a book. Now, who the hell writes a book at age 89? Now, I don't know. My family had been after me for years. Pop, you should write a book. I said, hey, what makes you think I can write a book? You've got to be talented to write a book. There are people that go to college four years to learn how to write, to write, write a book, and so on and so on. You've got to be able to uh, create dialogue and create uh, themes and uh, this and characters and so on. I said, uh, I, I can't do that. My daughter said to me, listen, Pop, when you tell stories to people, they all sit around fascinated listening to the story. Just tell a story. And, you know, that clicked up here, even at age 89. Well, of course I can do that. You don't have to make anything up. You just sit down. And at that time, there's uh, this um, uh, computer program called Dragon Naturally Speaking. You talk into a microphone, the computer prints it. You know, if I had to type that thing, it would have never got written. I don't know how to type. But all I had to do was sit there. And tell the story. And that my book, and I'm going to give you a copy before you leave. The story of my life, people like it. Uh, 
it came out in uh, 2015. It's uh, we're past the 5,000 mark, and and uh, it's still selling on Amazon, and and uh, a lot of people order it from me. I have books here. So, at at any rate, uh, my life since then has been, uh, you know, in. in Age eighty-five, you should you should be going down. I I, I I'm living the life of Riley. I I got uh, every year I go to Europe three times: Normandy, Holland, and Bastogne. And I have all kinds of friends there and so on. We go to ceremonies and so on. We also have fun and drink and <laughs> some some of the things you'll see on YouTube, but not uh, uh, ceremonies and honor. Uh, they're uh, sitting in the bar there, drinking beer and uh, smoking cigars and so on. But at any rate, my future, hey, uh, I'm 95. But whatever the story is, while I'm still able to do things, I'm going to keep going, that's all. And that's the end of my story. A toast to all the good people of the world. <laughs>